All right, sorry for, for getting here so late uh, uh, and whatnot. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I'm going to try and uh, expedite some things uh, here getting started. So first off, I'm just, because I was a little late getting here because of traffic, I'm just going to forego attendance. Everybody's going to be here today, so we'll keep it simple there. Um, here's something I, I, I thought about. I never got a chance to uh, record a video on that second example, and I don't want to um, rush through it and I also don't want to disadvantage you on your homework. This is what I'm going to do and I'll send an email uh, here in a little bit uh, to sort of officially state this but I'm going to extend the deadline on homework number four to Thursday. It was supposed to be due on Tuesday the 16th. I'm going to extend it to Thursday the 18th and we're going to do that example together in here. Okay? So I, cause I, don't want, I don't think it's right to penalize you because you know, I didn't get a chance to, to do that. Um, but then again, you all know I've had a busy few days. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, now, just so you're aware, to keep on schedule, homework five is still going to be assigned Tuesday. Like I'm still going to put it online. So like for those of you that already have homework four number done, it's fine. You can go ahead and get started on homework number five. Um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to go ahead and do that example, and then I'm going to jump straight into to bending stresses. Okay? Now, I just came right here. I didn't even grab my notebook from my office. So hopefully, a couple of you all brought a calculator because we'll uh, need your assistance in doing some of these problems. But I sort of like that. It keeps you all uh, somewhat engaged. So let's just jump right into it. So last time we finished this problem, uh, which is uh, our first chair and moment diagram problem. And I think it illuminated a lot of things for us, how the process you know, can be pretty straightforward, but you can, get a, you can glean a lot of really good uh, info and data from it. So l let me pull up a couple things with that last example just to get us back into the swing of things. So this is the example that we looked at, and the process for drawing a shear diagram or a moment diagram is incredibly straightforward. You know, you determine your support reactions, use the free body diagram of the beam to draw the shear diagram, and then use the areas under the shear diagram to draw the moment diagram. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, and there's a couple of things about shear diagrams and moment diagrams that will pretty much always be the case. Uh, and, and I'm going to add some caveats to that with the next example. First off, um, uh, when you take a look at, let's say, your shear diagram, and this is true with your moment diagram uh, as well, but we always started at zero and ended at zero. So for instance, we, at A, we started at zero, and yeah, we went up and down and up and down and up and down. But when it was all said and done, we started at zero and we ended right back at zero. And, and if you want, that's really just sort of a fancy uh, a graphical way of expressing that the sum of forces in the y direction has to be zero. I mean, as you go across the beam, they go up and down and up and down and up and down, but they start at zero and they end at zero. And the reason why is because these reactions at B and these reactions at C, they're these sort of like magical values, if you will, that those value, those reactions at B and C, you know, B is 4266.7 pounds and C it's 8133.3 pounds. Those values had to be those values so that if I started at zero and I went down, you know, let's say to 1600, then I jumped up and so on and so forth, that I would end uh, right back at zero. Now I say magical, they're not really magical. I'm using equations of equilibrium to determine them, but just wanted to give you a heads up. <coughs> now, we then use the area under the shear diagram to draw the moment diagram. Um, and there's a couple of different ways of thinking about it, but, you know, it's pretty much you know that in a nutshell. Uh, one of the things that we saw with the uh, the shear diagram and the moment diagram, when you look at the areas under the shear diagram, if you add up all your positive areas, we got something like 20,800, something like that. But when you add up all your negative areas, we got 20,800. Now, what that's basically indicating is that the sum of moments equals zero. That, that's basically a graphical representation of that. And another way of looking at it is to look at your moment diagram. We started at zero and we ended at zero. Now, again, it went up and down and up and down, but there you go. Now, what's going to happen on the next example is that your positive area is not going to equal your negative area. That's not going to be the case. But there's going to be a way that we get around that. And it's not really a way that we get around that. It's a way that physics is getting around with uh, around it. And it basically comes from the boundary conditions. And, and I'll just sort of leave it at that, and, and we'll, uh, we'll explore this here in a second. All right. So here's the problem that we're going to look at. We're going to draw the shear and moment diagram for this beam. 
Now, this beam is a little different than the one we did before. Uh, this beam uh, is utilizing uh, what's called a fixed support. So if you ever hear the term cantilevered beam or a cantilevered structure, this is basically what you're talking about. When you have, you know, let's say a beam and one end is fixed and the rest of the, the beam or the structure is extending out from that, you, you'd say this, this structure is cantilevered out from, uh, from point A. So if you ever hear the term cantilever, that, that's what that means. Now, this reaction at A is special. If you, if you recall, um, let me go back to the previous example. In the previous example, we had a pin support at B, so it had a reaction in the X direction and a reaction in the Y direction, and that roller at C just had a, a reaction in the Y direction. Well, this support at A has three reactions. It has an unknown reaction in the X direction, an unknown reaction in the Y direction, and an unknown moment reaction. Okay? Now, uh, a couple of these are, are pretty easy to determine. For instance, what is the uh, reaction at A in the X direction? It's zero. There are no forces acting horizontally on the structure at all. So, yeah, technically there is a horizontal reaction because it's a fixed end, but it's zero. So, okay. The vertical reaction is pretty simple because you can just add up all the loads. So, let me, um, let me just get right to it. So, uh, let me draw this out. So, so, this is example number 18, is it? There we go. 19, 19, thank you. Okay. Now we have, so we have a load that comes like this. And we have a load that comes like this. Okay. Now, this one, a thousand pounds and a hundred pounds per foot. Hundred pounds per foot. And then our distances are five, ten, and fifteen. So, 5, 10, 15. Okay. Now, so here, here's our structure. I mean, I'm just going to label this point A. This is point B. This is point C. This is point D. Um, right off the bat, I don't think we really need to do any math to indicate that the that this reaction here, this is AX, and that's zero. That, that's pretty simple, okay? Now, what about the vertical reaction? Let's just keep it simple. Do you think the vertical reaction is acting upwards or is it acting downwards? Yeah. It's acting up because all my forces are acting downwards. So, so what I might do is I might say I have a vertical reaction here. We'll say AY equals, and we don't know what it is yet, but, but I think that's pretty simple. Can anybody tell me, does anybody know right offhand how much AY is? 2,500, okay? Now we can draw the table and list everything going up and everything going down, but I think this is pretty simple. The only forces on the structure are going down. What do we have? Well, we have 1,000 pounds going down, but then we have this going down. Well, how much is that? Well, it's 100 pounds per foot over a distance of 15 feet, so that's 1,500 pounds. So if I got 1,500 going down and I got 1,000 going down, that's 2,500 pounds, right? So I think that's pretty simple. So what I might do is I might just say sum of forces in the x direction equals zero, and so that's ax equals zero. Sum of forces in the y direction equals zero, and that's ay is 2,500 pounds going up. So far so good? I, I think that's pretty simple. Speaking of, let me do this. Let me idealize that as that single 1,500-pound load. And let me ask you this. From C, how, how far is that distance right there? That's 7.5 feet. So far, so good? Okay. Now, we still have one equation of equilibrium left, right? And that's sum of moments. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sum moments at A. Um, in fact, here, I think just to clean up my drawing a little bit, I'm going to erase this. I don't think it's totally necessary. 
Um, to, su uh, to, to, to sum moments, I'm going to sum moments at A, and the reason I'm summing moments at A is because that vertical reaction at A, that 2,500 pounds, goes right through it. And just so that everybody's on the same page, I am going to, you know, draw my little table out. So let me sum moments at A. Okay. So I don't have to consider AY, because remember, if I'm summing moments at A, AY goes directly through it, so I don't have to worry about that. And then for, uh, so, so our remaining moments, I have this 1,000 pounds, right? It's rotating in this direction, and that's a moment arm of five feet, right? So 1,000 pounds, five feet. And then I have 1,500 pounds also in that direction. What's that moment arm? It's 22 and a half, right? Because it's 5 plus 10, so that's 15, 7 and a half, that's 22 and a half feet. Everybody okay with that? All right. And then that can only be resisted by one thing, and that's a moment reaction at A. So keep in mind, there's a moment reaction right there. There's a concentrated moment right there. So there's a, an MA there. Because remember, that's a fixed support. Fixed supports have unknown uh, forces in the x direction, unknown forces in the y direction, and unknown moments. Okay? So let's sum this out. So 1,000 times 5, that's 5,000. And then 1,500 times 22.5. I'm not that good. This one's 33,750. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So oh, I drew an extra zero. Let me do that. So let's see. 33,750 and 5,000, that's 38,750, right? So 38,750 foot pounds equals MA, right? And so that, that's positive, right? So our direction was correct. So MA is 38. 750 foot-pounds in that direction. Sound good? All right. Okay. Well, if you've got that, then the process is exactly the same as it was before. Exactly the same. Okay? So, we're going to draw our little guidelines. And again, if you got a straight edge or something with you, that makes life a lot easier with these things. Okay, we're going to start with the shear diagram. Okay, and I'm going to put this sort of low. So shear. So far so good? Okay, all right. So tell me, if I start at zero, I got to end at zero, so we start at zero. What's the very first thing that I do? Shoot up 2,500. I have a reaction at A, that 2,500 pounds at A, that's shooting me right up. So right up 2,500. Okay, right up to 2,500, and then from A to B, what does the shear diagram look like? It's flat, right? Flat, straight line, all right? So this is flat. And so this is 2,500. Here, I don't need the units on here because I've indicated the units over there, so I'll just sort of save myself some hassle. Then what do I do? Sudden drop down, right? So if I'm at 2,500 and I go down 1,000, that puts me at 1,500, right? So that's going to be a sudden drop down. Get that out of the way. Sudden drop down, and it's going to go somewhere about like that, and that's going to be 1,000, right? What about from B to C? What does it look like? Straight line across. No change. No change in load. No slope on the shear diagram. 
Oh, yes, you're right. You're exactly right. Yes, that's 1,500. Thank you. All right. And so I'm at 1,500 here. Now, from C to D, what happens? Go to zero, and what does it look like? Just triangle, just straight line down. All right. So first off, first off, we should, you know, all be pretty aware that, that at least, you know, from a sum of forces in the y direction, the shear diagram looks correct. You know, it started at zero and it ended at zero. Okay. Now, in order to draw the moment diagram, we need the area under the shear diagram. So let's let's determine that out. Okay. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take this and I'm going to split it up into three basic shapes. Okay. Let's just do that. And so let's take it left to right. Okay. So I think I can do a couple of these, and you can help me out with the others. Okay, so the first one, it's 2,500 tall and it's five wide. So is that 12,500? I do that right? Okay, so, and that's positive, right? Because it's above the line, right? Remember, if you ever want to clarify your shear diagrams or your moment diagrams, you can always put like little tick marks or little arrows on your shear diagrams. Makes it a little easier to see if you're only using one color, like if you don't have colored pencils or anything. Yeah, me doing this on the board I, and the, on the screen I got the luxury of different colors really easily you might not have that just you know on an exam so okay so this is plus 12,500 okay now the next one it's 1500 times 10 so the well hold, hold on hold on um, are we talking or which shape are we talking about no, that, yeah, 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 and it would, and it'd be one half of fifteen hundred times fifteen. Yeah, yeah. So this one, this one's fifteen thousand. What'd you get for the third one? Eleven thousand two hundred and fifty, and this is fifteen thousand. All right, everybody agree with this? Okay, now we got a problem. Okay, because right now um, everything's positive. Okay. Remember what we had in our last problem, and let me let me pull the last problem up because I want to I want to illustrate this. I want to make sure everybody sees this. If you look at our last problem, we had a shear diagram that looked like this, and so all the positive area equaled all the negative area, and and that that, that was it, right? Well, that's not the case here. Here we have a bolt load of positive area. We don't have any negative area. So how is this going to work? Well, let's take a look at this. Let's add up all the positive numbers. What do you get when you add them up? 38, you get 38,750. Does that number seem familiar? That's the reaction, right? So let's sort of think this out logically. Okay, whenever you're drawing a, a moment diagram, you look at the area under the shear diagram, right? And if you have a positive area, you draw it upwards. If you have a negative area, you're going to draw it downwards, right? All of these values are positive, right? So they're going to draw, they're going to draw upwards, if that makes any sense. So if I'm at, you know, let's say a point in the shear or in the moment diagram and I see this 15,000, I'm gonna go up 15,000, right? So all these values are telling me to go up. Well, there's too many positive values. Where do I get the negative 38,750? I get it from the reaction. So so here how is how this is going to work, okay? Exactly right. Exactly right. Here, here's the easy way of thinking about it. Okay. Here's my moment diagram. Okay. Here's an easy way of thinking about it. I'm going to start at zero and, and let, let me start explaining. Let's go to the shear diagram. We started at zero. What's the very first thing that we did? We went up 2,500. Why do we go up 2,500 right there? Because there was a concentrated load at A. I propose there is a concentrated moment at A. So that 38,750, I propose that that 
acts just like a point load and we drop down. That's what I propose. So that is minus 38.750. Okay. Now, sort of follow this along, see what's going to happen. Okay. I'm at negative 38,750 and I go up 12,500. What's that going to put me at right here? What's that value? Minus 26,250. And then if you add 15,000 to that, what does that put you at? Minus 11,250. And then that's going to bring you back to zero. Does that make sense? So what I'm getting at is when you're looking at a point load like 1,000 pounds going down or 2,500 pounds going up, it's, I think it's pretty easy to see, oh, that's the shear diagram. Go up, go down. But when you're looking at moments, especially if the beams and the structures get a little more complicated, sometimes I have a hard time seeing which way you draw the moment. Does that moment cause it to go up or does that moment cause it to go down? And sometimes I, I find that that's a little difficult. Um, uh, there's a couple ways of getting around that and we, we discuss those ways like very in detail when, you, when we take structural analysis because we cut sections and write functions and all that stuff. But really I think the easiest way of looking at it is this. See this shear diagram? There's too much positive area. So we need a negative value to bring us down to get us to zero. And that's sort of the way that I think about it. And I think it's the easiest way to, to conceptualize what your moment diagram should look like. Does that sound good? Now. As for your moment diagram, and as for what it looks like, the region between A and B and B and C is very simple. Constant shear, constant slope. Constant shear, constant slope. So between here and here, they're straight lines. All right, so this is where if you got a you know, driver's license or your straight edge or something, this is where that comes into play. All right. Now, as for your moment diagram, look at your magnitudes. The shear magnitude is from a lot to a little. The magnitude is from a lot to a little. So the slope, a lot to a little. And so our shear diagram, or our moment diagram, will look something like that. So if you want, you can say your V max is 2,500 pounds and M max is 38,750 foot pounds. Excuse me. Are there any questions on this? Any questions? All right. Um, one thing I do want to mention, as a, an engineer, and this is something to keep in mind, um, I don't like to use the terms always and never in, in engineering period. However, there's a very, very high probability that this will always be the case. Whenever you're looking at a cantilevered beam, like it's supported at A and extends out, your maximum shears and moments tend to be at A. Okay, because that's the point that's got to hold the whole thing up. So from a designer's perspective, if you have ensured that your beam has adequate capacity at A, as long as you're using the same beam throughout, you know you're good. Okay, so that, that's from a behavioral standpoint. That's just something to keep in mind. Now, I could very easily take that beam and load it all sorts of different ways where I get a maximum shear and moment somewhere else. But Realistically, that usually doesn't happen very much. Usually what happens is you have a beam sticking out and you got a bunch of stuff on it. And so the worst case scenario is that support. Sound good? Okay. Now, let's sort of, nope, oh, I did not mean to type something there. All right. This might seem weird, but I'm actually going to go back a little bit on one of my announcements. If you remember, one of our main goals is to really look at this. Remember, we this I value, this moment of inertia, I think we spent a lot of time investigating what was going on with the moment of inertia. And 
we just spent the last little bit determining like how do you determine V and M, your maximum shears and moments off your shear diagram. I think we figured that part uh, out uh, as well. But now let's look at the stresses as a whole. What's going on with these stresses? Okay. So I want to now start to talk a little bit uh, about bending stress. Okay. Now, one thing to keep in mind, um, we did one big roundabout uh, way of getting here. Okay. Um, you know, we started talking about shear and moment diagrams, and we started talking about parallel axis theorem and moments of inertia. I did that for a very specific reason. Okay. If I were to just you know, when we finish with torsion, if I was to just say, okay, now let's talk about stresses and beams. As soon as I start this derivation, there's going to be terms that you haven't seen. So it's like, okay, now I have to stop. Let's go over here and explain what that is and get back to the derivation. Oh, wait, you don't know what a moment of inertia is. Oh, let's go back and explain that. And so it gets real convoluted real quick. And so I found usually what the easiest thing to do is, is let's just take moments of inertia, let's take shear moment diagrams and handle them on their own, and then let's go back uh, and do this. And I think you'll find uh, that this will go pretty smoothly. So a, a couple of things, like I don't care if you're a civil engineer or mechanical engineer, you're going to have a system that you're designing where something's being bent. I just, I, I don't care what, what your major is or what you end up doing. Uh, if you design any system that is in the solid mechanics realm, and by solid mechanics realm, I mean solid objects being subjected to external forces and, and demands, you know. And basically, I'm trying to, you know, say that, you know, anything that's not fluid mechanics, you know, like liquids and gases and things like that. If you're designing any system with solid mechanics, probably something in there is being bent. And so understanding stresses and beams is incredibly important. Now, we're going to do bending stresses first, and we'll do shear stresses later, okay? Now, keep in mind, whenever you have a beam, you are pretty much always going to have regions in the beam that is experiencing both shear stress and normal stress, which is also a problem that we haven't experienced yet in this class, okay? For instance, let's take axial members, right? We took axial members, yanked on them, got a normal stress, right? We took uh, torsional members, we took them, twisted them, got a shear stress, right? What if I took a member, yanked it, and twisted it? Then you'd get both, right? You get axial stress and shear stress. So how do you handle uh, a member that is subjected to multiple stresses? Okay, that is coming later. I promise you. Okay, but for now we're going to handle it sort of piecewise, and we'll lump it all together uh, in the end. Now, okay, when we cut a section, let's go back to basics. We cut a section, we can have three uh, unknowns, right? You know, some forces in the x direction, some forces in the y direction, some moments. Tells us that we can have three unknown force components inside a member, an axial load P, uh, a shear, and a bending moment, right? Uh, you know, a, a P, a P coming from the sum of forces in the x direction, V from sum of forces in Y, and so on and so forth. Now, we've spent the last little bit basically trying to understand how do V and M get distributed on a beam? Like that's what a shear diagram and a moment diagram is. They tell you what those values are uh, at various sections. Well, as we'll see in a moment, no pun intended, um, <laughs> um, I even put that in the slide, you know. We'll say that that's my first dad joke of the semester. Yeah, what's that? Yes, yeah, I say it for dad joke, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, first off, as we'll see in a moment, um, we know that, so from each of those loads, we have an a axial load, a shear, and a moment. Each of those loads can generate a stress. Now, axial loads, the P, well, we generate, that generates normal stress. We know what that is. That's sigma equals P over A. We, we've been, we figured that out long ago. Okay? Bending moments generate stresses, and shears generate stresses. Now, the shear stresses, we're going to handle off to the side. I want to talk about that. Okay, we'll talk about that, that bending stress. Now, we're going to make some assumptions with this derivation. Okay, we're going to make uh, some assumptions, A, to simplify our math, and B, to reflect real world behavior actually pretty well. Okay, this is something I say in day one uh, in structural analysis, and I think it's, I don't know that I ever actually, you know, uh, 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 stated this in here, but it's worth mentioning. You know, this whole time we've been talking about analyzing the stresses on systems and the stresses on structures. 
that's not really what we're doing in here. Um, we're like when we analyze a gear shaft, we're not analyzing the stresses on that gear shaft. We're analyzing the stresses on a mathematical model that represents that gear shaft. Okay, and I know that might seem like you're splitting hairs. Um, and in simple situations, I'd say it kind of is. But as an engineer, somebody's going to come to you one day and say, "Tell me how to design this," and it's going to be something you've never seen before and you've never dealt with before. And so your job as the engineer or the analyst or the designer is going to be, you're going to have to approach this for, from square one. And so if it's a solid mechanics problem where you're trying to determine uh, stresses for designs and what have you, you might need to develop your own model and your own way of, of, of representing these forces so that you can, uh, you can get some answers. I just say that to you uh, just so that you're aware that there is a little bit of deviation from real life, a little bit. Now, let's be clear um, that in some situations it can be a lot and that's when you have to test them. Like if you were trying to determine the stresses on a V6 engine after, you know, fatigue and, and thermal stress and whatnot, like you got to break out some, some high-end computer models to figure that out. But, a, you know, a beam in a building, we can make some assumptions and, and we're good enough for government work. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Now, here's the assumptions that we're going to make, okay? Uh, first off, we're going to make the assumption that uh, the material is linear. So it follows Hooke's law, right? So, you know, if I put 100 pounds on a beam and I generate 20 PSI, if I put 300 pounds on the beam, I generate 60 PSI. That it's just, it's linear, it's proportional. That's, that's what that means, okay? Strain compatibility, okay? That one's a, a little bit difficult to explain. Um, let me see. Can I borrow your notebook? Just, just that, that three-ring button. Okay, all right. Here's what strain compatibility means, and I'm not going to mark on your notebook. So, um, and, and I'll be honest, this usually works better if you have something like a, a like a, 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 maybe something like a, 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 a composite notebook, maybe something like that. Not maybe something like yeah or something like that actually this this one's better okay you can have this back his, his is better <laughs> i'm not going to mark on your notebook but but i'll let you sort of check this out uh, on your own time um, this is what plain sections remain uh, plain mean okay take a, a notebook something like this right draw a vertical line Just draw a vertical line okay and then take that notebook and bend it okay what you will see is that line go like this, but it's usually, it remains a straight line, okay? So what I'm getting at is that when you, when you bend a section, okay, when you bend a section, it's gonna be curved, but that section remains plain. It remains flat, okay? That's what we mean when we say plain sections remain plain, okay? So what that means from a mathematical perspective is that all the deformation is going to be linearly proportional as well. And it's going to be linearly proportional from a very specific point in the structure, and that point is the centroid. At the centroid, there's going to be no deformation, and then as the, you know, we get away from the centroid, the deformations get larger and larger. And so that, you'll see where that comes into play here in a second. Now, we're also going to assume uh, what's called small deflections, okay? That's going to be a little difficult to, to understand right off the bat, but I, but I got a perfect example, okay? Let's say I'm standing on top of a mountain, okay? And Mr. Walker doesn't like me very much, and he decides to shove me, okay? Now, he shoves me. I might be able to, like, catch my balance or whatnot, right? But imagine he did the same thing, but instead of me just standing like this, I was wearing, let's say, like an 80-pound backpack. It's going to be a little bit more difficult for me to stand upright, right? Okay. The reason why, like, let's say that I was like a, a fixed beam or a column in a structure. What happens in that scenario is this. I've got this massive weight pulling me down, right? Okay. And he gives me a shove. What happens? Okay. Well, I go over a little bit, right? Well, what happens when I go over? Well, that backpack is now off center, right? It's now off my center of gravity. So what does that do? That causes some moment which causes me to go over, which causes more moment, which causes me to go over, which causes more moment. Cause, see how it builds on itself? That's what's called a second order effect, when you have to consider the equilibrium of the structure after it's deformed, 
okay? And in some scenarios, that is incredibly, incredibly important. Whenever you have systems that are subjected to compression and they want to buckle, second order effects can be a real big deal, okay? And so that's something to consider. We are going to talk about buckling near the end of the semester uh, as well. But th that's just something to keep in mind. Like building design, like when they designed this building, well, think what happens on a day like today. Well, wind is hitting the building, right? Well, think wind is pushing the building over, but the building isn't exactly light as a feather, right? It's pretty heavy, right? So that wind is pushing the building over, but it's also going down like this. So it can kind of build on itself. So that's that sort of mean by, by second order effects. You can handle second order effects, but for basic beam theory, we, we don't worry about it. Okay. Now, if we make these assumptions, we can treat the problem as follows, okay? So here's a beam, right, over here on the left, and here's the support. I've drawn a coordinate system, right? So I got my y-axis right at the beginning of the beam, and I got the x-axis. Now look where the x-axis is going. It's going through the centroid. So wherever y equals zero, that's where the centroid is, right? Now, what I've got here is if I cut a section and I look at the beam, I've got this sort of like potato looking thing here just to indicate that that's a beam of an arbitrary cross section. It could be a square, it could be a circle, it could be an I-beam, it could be whatever. It's just, it doesn't matter what it looks like. The only thing that matters is here's the beam in general and the centroid is right there. If you're okay with that, that that's all that matters, okay? Now, we, can, we have a beam, we have it subjected to whatever loads we've got, distributed loads, point loads, it doesn't matter. Now, we know we can use statics to cut a section and determine whatever this axial force is, whatever that bending moment is. Now, we know that they're going to cause normal stress, but the question is how much, okay? Well, here's what I propose, okay? I propose that if we're assuming that the beam's response is linear, if we're assuming the beam's response is linear, um, then I propose that as a function of y that the bending or that the normal stress on this uh, section is going to look something like this. And so I propose that's an equation of a line, you know, in y. So you can sort of think of this as mx plus b, where this is your slope, that's your intercept, and this is x because the line's going up and down, not not this way. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So. We've got this function, it seems to make sense because all of our assumptions have pretty much indicated that our stresses are going to be linear, but how do we get those unknown constants? Well, we know that the beam is subjected to two known loads. We know the axial force and we know the bending moment, so we can use those two loads to solve for your unknown constants. It's like if you're ever uh, dealing with a, a problem in calculus or differential equations, if you have two unknown constants, how do you solve for those constants? You need boundary conditions. Well, it's the same thing here. Okay, now, I'll take some time on this. I want to make sure this is clear. Okay, so here's my beam, right? The, the you know, arbitrary potato looking cross section, right? And I'm going to cut myself out a little slice, just a little, remember, differential, little infinitesimal element, super tiny, all right? Now, what is the area of this slice? I'm going to say the area of this slice is dA, you know, just some little infinitesimal itty bitty element, okay? And I'm going to say that it is some distance y from the centroid. Remember, that's the centroid, and it's some distance y, right? Well, I propose that the axial force on that, uh, on that element is the stress times the area. So sigma times whatever dA is, or dA. Now, the moment, what's the difference between this and the moment? Well, how do you determine a moment? It's a force times a moment arm, right? How far is this from the centroid? It's y, right? Make sense? Not too bad, right? Now, we'll take some time on this one. It's not so bad. Let's take this first one, this dp. If this dp is the stress times the area, well, what is the stress? Well, it's that equation of that line, right? Okay? Now, what I want you to do then is I want you to pay attention to this and this. Let's just look at these first, okay? So if you're all right with that, 
here's the, the little for, the force in that little element, that, that equation times dA. Let's integrate, right? Let's integrate. So what do we got? Integrate this. Now, how did I get from here to here? Well, we got the integral of a sum. It's the sum of, the inter sum of integrals, so split that up. And then I factored out my constants. Everybody okay with that? Not too bad, right? What about the moments? Okay. How is this equation different from this one? There's that y there, right? See the y? So now I'm doing the same thing. Okay. Just doing the same thing. Now I haven't evaluated any of these integrals, so it's not like I, you know, did anything, you know, uh, you know, absorbably difficult so far. I'm just spacing them out and, and sort of taking them, you know, at face value. Everybody okay with this? Now, let's take a look at this. All right. So here's these two expressions for these integrals, right? I got the expression for the axial load and the expression for the moment, and I'm expressing them in terms of these constants that I'm trying to figure out, right? Well, don't they, look at those terms in the parentheses. Don't they look familiar? We've seen those before, right? Remember, what is the integral of dA? That's the area, right? What's the integral of y squared dA? That's ix, right? That's what that is, okay? What's the integral of y dA? Well, we use that to determine the centroid. Where was the centroid on this problem, by the way? So it's zero, right? So here's what's going on. We can make some substitutions. We'll call that the area, call that the moment of inertia, and then this integral right here, since the centroid is zero, it makes that zero as well. So plug and chuck, it's pretty simple. Here is that expression for P, that term goes to zero, that term's A, so P equals C1A. For example, what C1 is, right? As for moment, C1 times this, that's zero, plus C2 times that, that's the moment of inertia. There's our constants. Sound good? So, if you're wondering where we're going with this, here's where we're going with this. I propose that if you have some generic beam and you're trying to determine the normal stress, it's a function of two things. Sigma equals P over A, which is the normal stress component, and it's N plus MY over I, the bending stress component. Okay? Now, so the total stress, we can have stress at the centroid. Keep in mind, we can have stress at the centroid, but that only comes from the axial load. From the bending uh, moment, we have zero stress at the centroid, and it gets uh, larger as you go uh, out from that. Does that make sense? Not too bad, right? So, first off, let's also take a look at this uh, equation that we got. Sigma equals P over A. That was what we got for the bending stress, did, did, or from the normal stress. Did that make sense? Well, it should have. We've been using that for the past you know, few weeks, you know. So, hopefully you, you can kind of see where that's going from. Just so you're aware, if you all are, 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 are feeling springy and, and want to read the textbook, the way that I derived this, completely different than the way the textbook derives it. But I kind of think this is easier to follow right now, especially since we haven't talked about beam deflections. But just so you're aware. Okay. So, in short, here is the fundamental expression for uh, bending stress in a beam. Sigma equals my over i. So the way that you determine that is you need three quantities. You need the bending moment, which you can get from your moment diagram. You need the moment of inertia, which you now know how to compute. Or you need uh, the, uh, or the, and the last thing that you need is this distance y. Now this distance y is the distance from the centroid. So if I have a beam, let's say here's the beam, and I'm trying to determine the bending stress, well, I need to know where we're talking about. If we're talking about, let's say, on the top of the beam, well, it's the distance from the centroid to the top. So that would be my y distance. If I'm trying to determine the stress, let's say, on the bottom of the beam, it's from here to the bottom. Does that make sense? So whenever you bend a beam, I'm going to borrow your notebook real quick. 
Whenever you bend a beam, what happens is this. Here's the beam, and I bend it. The top of the beam wants to push together, right? It wants to, to push in on itself. The bottom is wanting to pull apart, okay? So whenever you bend a beam, thank you. Whenever you bend a beam like that, you're going to see that the top of the beam uh, in that scenario uh, is experiencing compression. The bottom is experiencing tension. The middle isn't experiencing anything. And by the middle, I mean the neutral axis, where the centroid is, okay? Make sense? Now, um, just so you are aware, um, if you look at the bending stress profile, let's, let's also look at this from a design perspective. If you're an engineer, do you really care what the stress is right there? Why don't you just care about, like, this is all we care about, right? Where the stress is at the very, very top or the very, very bottom, okay? We, we have a name for that uh, in, in engineering. We call that the extreme fiber stress, okay? The extreme fiber stress, let's say on a beam, is the one, let's say, either at the way tippy, 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 tippy top of the beam or the very, 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 very bottom of the beam, okay? Now, um, what we usually do uh, in uh, structural or mechanical engineering is we define a new section property, and we call that term the section modulus, okay? The section modulus is basically taking the moment of inertia and dividing it by that extreme fiber distance so that all you need is just another section property, okay? So if you take uh, section modulus and define it as I over C, you can compute your bending stress uh, quite easily. We'll, we'll look at that in a little more detail in some examples here in a little bit. Um, but if you ever hear that term section modulus, that's what that means. It's basically saying, well, here's the moment of inertia. Let's take the moment of inertia and divide it by that extreme fiber distance. So all I have to do is take my bending moment, divide it by that, and there's my stress. So it's sort of a little shortcut. Now, when you are dealing with section moduli, you can have, if the beam isn't symmetrical, you can have a section modulus to the top of the beam and a section modulus to the bottom of a beam. However, if you're dealing with a beam like this, where it's just a, a like a wooden joist or a rectangle, well, think about it like this. Where is the centroid of this rectangle? Just for sake of discussion. Right here, right? Okay. So the bending stress is going to be the same on the top and as it is on the bottom. So we don't need a different section modulus for the top and a different section modulus for the bottom, right? It, it's the same value. And I'll, I'll show you that. We'll, we'll get into that here in a second. Okay? Everybody okay with this? All right. This example is going to be real short because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the data from problems 18 and 19 to see whether or not this beam is behaving satisfactorily. So we're not, I'm not using factors of safety in this problem. I'm just going to use the 4,000 PSI as a limit. We'll just see whether it's good or not. Um, but I have a beam that's 3 inches wide that's 10 inches tall. Okay, so let's see if this beam is sufficient. Uh, discard. It took me a second. I was like, what is it talking about? Oh my goodness. All right. So Okay. Beam cross section. Here's what my beam looks like. This is 3 inches. This is 10 inches. Now, right off the bat, what is uh, that distance? That's 5 inches. OK, all right, that's simple. And let's also be clear that this distance is also five inches. Sound good? All right. Now, let me see something real quick. Sorry. Okay. All right. I have a point I'm going to make near the end. Just bear with me. 
Okay, so, so there's that right off the bat. All right, because those distances are the same, if your bending stress is proportional from the centroid, I propose that whatever bending stress we get on the top is whatever bending stress we get on the bottom. It's going to be the same value. Now, one's going to be in compression, one's going to be in tension, but it's going to be the same numerical value, so we aren't going to need to do this twice. All right, so that's one point I want to make. Second point I want to make uh, is this. Okay, what is the moment of inertia of this shape? It's a rectangle, so what's the moment of inertia? Anybody remember? BH cubed over 12. All right, so that is... And what is that? So that's 1,000 divided by 4. Did I do that right? Did I do that right? Okay. So far so good? Now, as for our y distance, our y distance in this case is just going to be h over 2, right? From the centroid to the way, way, way tippy, tippy top, or the way, 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 very, very, very bottom. Sound good? All right. Now, let's look at moments. Example 18 and 19. <coughs> so, let me go back a little bit. Here's example 18. I propose that based on our bending moment diagram, the absolute worst case bending moment, you know, the largest magnitude, you know, absolute value magnitude, is right there. And so I'm going to take my bending moment as 12,000 foot-pounds. Okay? All right, so we'll say M 12,000 foot-pounds. Okay, now, before we go any further, let's talk about units. Let's talk about units. Um, what is the allowable bending stress for this problem in? Is it what, KSI? What is it? PSI. Say it again. PSI, pounds per square inch. Our moment of inertia is in inches. This is in inches. This is in feet and pounds. The pounds are right, but the feet are not. So how do I convert this to inch pounds? You multiply by 12. All right. Now for example 19, what's the maximum moment? 38,750. And so what is that? I'm, I'm not that good. Second? Okay, all right. So therefore, the bending stress well, for let's say problem 18 is my over i, which is which is what 2880. Do I have a second on that? 2880 what? PSI. The stress. And you have pounds times inches times inches on the top, so pounds times inches squared on the top, and on the bottom you have inches to the fourth. So two of those cancel and you get pounds and then inches squared on the bottom, so PSI. Everybody okay with that? Now, help me out with this. What's that one going to be? 
I think you could probably just compute it on your own, right? You're just going to replace the moments, right? So if you replace that moment with 465, what do you get? You got 9,300? So sigma allowable was 4,000. All right. So let's just make some general behavioral observations. Would you feel fine using this beam for problem number 18? Like if you were the engineer and somebody came to you and said, I need you to tell me what beam I need to use to safely resist those loads. Would you be fine with that beam for problem 18? What about something, something like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, well safe. What about 19? Absolutely not. Everybody okay with that? Now here's, here's the rub. Okay, let's say this is my beam, right? I'm going to use my cell phone, right? So three inches wide, 10 inches tall, and it's going like this. So let me go back to problem 18. Here's my beam, right? So when I say three inches wide and 10 inches tall, I'm saying that that is 10 inches and like that is three inches. So if you want like a... Uh, uh, a visual understanding, what's that deep? 4,000 pounds. So, like, here's what I mean. You're going to test my, it's going to test my 3D art skills. But, so, here's what we're saying. Okay, so here's the way that I, I'm saying that this beam is oriented, right? So here's the beam. The 10 inches goes up and the 3 inches goes like that, right? Now let's just use problem 18. What if I took the beam and I did that? What happens if I do that? Well, there, there we go. Let, let's, let's, let's test that out. So let's, what happens if the beam was faced like this, okay? So this is 10 inches, this is three inches, okay? That's my centroid. What's my Y value here? We said one and a half inches. What is IX in this case? It's Somebody got a value on this? Like, you got that calculator. Say it again. 7.5 inches to the fourth. So help me out with this. What would the bending stress be? It'd be Uh oh, they're challenging you, man. Say it again. What? So what's was it? Twenty-two. Everybody good with that? Okay. All right. And so this is one point five inches, and this is twenty-two point five inches to the fourth. What does that come out to be? Ninety-six hundred. Think about that. By taking the beam and doing that to it, the stresses jump through the roof, right? Okay, what I'm introducing you to is a phenomenon called strong axis versus weak axis, okay? Imagine a diving board, okay? How, what's a diving board look like? It's flat, it's long this way, and it's really thin that way, right? So when you stand on that diving board, it, it, it bends, right? 
It's got some flex to it. What if somebody took a diving board and they tilted it up 90 degrees and you had to jump off that, that end? It wouldn't have much flex to it, right? Because the diving board has much more flexural resistance, much more flexural stiffness that way than it does the other way, okay? So that's the difference between strong axis and weak axis. What I'm getting at is this. Up until now, we didn't really care about orientation. In other words, here's my member and I'm yanking on it. I'm applying axial tension. It didn't really matter whether or not it was facing like this or facing like that or facing like this. As long as I was yanking on it, the stress was P over A and the stress was P over A everywhere. Well, now the orientation matters because if I bend this way versus bending this way, I get different stresses, okay? The orientation and how you account for that is something that you need to, to, to highly you know, uh, consider. And I'm going to show you something and we're going to use it next time, but I want to show you something. I have a supplement on Blackboard and it's a supplement four and this is Appendix F in your textbooks, okay? Now, this is, uh, I'll be honest, for you mechanical engineers, this comes straight out of the civil engineer's playbook. So I, I apologize to you, but I want to show you something. All right? This is a, a pro, this is a series of properties of what are called wide flange shapes. You mechanical engineers who say, oh, that's an I-beam. Well, us civil engineers, there's a lot more to it than that. There's a diff number of different classifications. So we call these wide flanges or W shapes. Now, just so you're aware from a terminology perspective, this first one is W30 by 211. Anybody know what those two numbers mean? Any civils know what they mean yet? You might not have had it yet, so it's okay. The 30 stands for the depth. So this W30 by 211 is about 30 inches deep. It's not exactly 30 inches deep. It's about 30 inches deep. It's its nominal depth, okay? The 211 is how heavy it is. The t this W30 by 211, each foot of that section weighs 211 pounds. So it's, it's an easy way of determining weights, okay? Everybody okay with that? Now, one of the things that you'll notice in this table, though, are Number one, there's a series of dimensions that define what it looks like. So if I look at the W30 by 211, here's its cross-sectional area, here's how deep it is, here's how thick the web is, here's the flange, how thick it is and how wide it is. But here we've got this axis one and this axis two. And for each of these axes, we have a different I value, a moment of inertia. We have a different S value, that's that section modulus I showed you, either, uh, showed you earlier. Since this is symmetric either way, you got the same value. And then there's an R. We, we haven't talked about R yet. We will later. Don't, don't worry. We'll, we'll cover R. Okay? But notice how the moment of inertia is much bigger in one direction than it is in another. Okay? It's because I-beams are designed to be very, very stiff in one direction. See, if you take that I-beam and you bend it about this axis, you know, like here's the beam and you got the flange and the flange like that, it's incredibly strong. But if you take it and flip it like this to where you got a flange and a flange and then a web in the middle, really flimsy, really, really flimsy. And so that's reflected in its moment of inertia. So how you document that is something, you, you, you know, you just, you got to make sure that you're doing your bookkeeping properly because the way that a beam faces greatly impacts the, the stresses that you compute. Sound good? Any questions? All right. So like I said, I will send an email officially indicating that I've extended the deadline on homework number four, so don't worry about turning that in on Tuesday. Also, since I was late getting here, we'll just consider it a wash. We'll say everybody was here today, even though in, in, it, you know, I know a couple people aren't here, but that's okay. You know, I'm not going to blame anybody if I, if I was late myself. So, Sound good? All right. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. I will see you on Tuesday.